Hello and welcome to this video on objectivity and values in sociology. All members of society, including sociologists, have values, beliefs and opinions. Those are things we hold to be important, things we hold to be true and our views on the world. Some argue that it is both possible and desirable for sociologists to keep their subjective values out of their research. Others argue that staying value neutral or value free is impossible because sociologists are humans studying other humans and therefore are going to have opinions and those are going to intrude on their research. Some argue that it is desirable for sociologists to use their values to improve society. So actually it can act as a catalyst in this regard. We need to consider here the nature of knowledge before we go any further. Objective knowledge is the same no matter your point of view. Objective methods provide facts that can be easily verified or falsified, that is proven true or proven false. Objective knowledge is also value free and doesn't have any bias. So when something is objectively true or when something forms the basis of objective knowledge, it is absolutely true. Whereas subjective knowledge depends on your point of view. Subjective methods give data that can't be easily tested, that is verified or falsified. Subjective knowledge requires interpretation. So when you know something subjectively, you know it true to yourself. It is true to you, but for someone else, they may not see it that way. So it is not objective and absolute, it is subjective and personal. A very simple comparison could be if we were to look at Susan and we were perhaps to see that she was crying and we were to take her temperature using a thermometer, we'd be able to say objectively, tears are coming out of her eyes, she is crying and she is 39.3 degrees in terms of her personal temperature. Whereas subjectively, we could ask Susan how she feels and she might tell us, I have a really sore head and I feel really tired. And so that is something which is subjective to her, it's true to her, but we would not know that unless we asked her to interpret her symptoms for us. Early sociology was dominated by positivism and positivists. Auguste Comte and Emile Durkheim were two of these individuals. They said that sociology's job was to discover the truth about how society worked and to improve human life. Sociologists would be able to say with scientific certainty what was best for society. So they very much approached the study of society in a scientific manner. Karl Marx was also part of this gang in this regard, and he saw himself as a scientist. That's how he described himself. He believed he had discovered the truth about society's future and the inevitability of a classless society, that is communism, and therefore the collapse of capitalism. Max Weber comes along a little bit later, and he perhaps took a slightly more nuanced point of view. He distinguished between value judgments and facts, so things which are true and things which we believe to be true. He argued that a value can neither be proved nor disproved by facts because it's a personal opinion. However, he still sees an essential role for values in sociology, so he didn't think this was a problem. He thought actually it could be very useful. In terms of how values could work in sociology, well, they can guide research. We can only select areas of study according to their value relevance to us. The likelihood is if you're drawn to study something, it's because you're interested in it. It's unlikely you're going to study it if you're not. And so therefore your values have played a role in there because you placed importance in studying one thing rather than something else. Data collection and hypothesis testing. Sociologists must be as objective as possible when collecting the facts, he said. So when you actually get in your data, try and be value free if you can, even though the reason why you're collecting it may be very value laden. Values in the interpretation of data. Facts need to be set in a theoretical framework to understand their significance. The sociologists must therefore state their values explicitly. So at this stage, when you're going to try and explain things and build a theory based on the data you've gathered, at this point, you need to hold your hands up and say, these are my values. This is why I'm doing it. This is how I'm going to build this theory. Values and the sociologists as a citizen. 
He ultimately argued that sociologists cannot dodge the moral issues, the issues of right and wrong, their work raises, whilst hiding behind value freedom. So it may well be that you do some research on poverty, you discover something quite shocking, you now need to perhaps do something about that. You need to alert policymakers or political leaders to see that or to ensure that they do something about it. You cannot simply say, well, I'm just a sociologist doing some research for the sake of it. You probably need to do something about it. And so again, values are going to play a role. Max Weber therefore sees values as useful and important when choosing what to research, when interpreting data, and in the use of findings. But he believed that values must be kept out of the data gathering process. So he's still allowing a bit of that kind of early positivism, that scientific approach to the study of society, whilst also allowing values to perhaps have their place in the whole process overall. Sociology cannot tell us what values or goals we should hold, he said. He said that generally sociology was value free. We bring our values to it. But it can tell us what means we should adopt if we want to achieve certain goals and the consequence of holding certain values. So when we build our theories, it's going to tell us, well, if we do this, this is what's going to happen in society. Or rather, if we don't do this, this is what might happen as well. Railing against positivists are committed sociologists. And in particular, we're going to start here with the work of Howard Becker and the interactionist position. He argued that social life is based on interactions in which the meaning of events and actions are negotiated. So we as human beings are constantly acting and interacting with others and then we attach meanings to those things and we negotiate those meanings. Meanings are closely linked to the issue of values because the meaning the social actor attaches to an event will reflect their values. So how you perceive something is rooted in your personal beliefs, your personal values, what you hold to be important. Values are unavoidable in sociology, Becker argued, stating that we cannot avoid taking sides. It's almost a natural human predilection. We often, once we've gathered data or looked at something, take a side. Often, pre-interactionist sociological investigations reflected only the viewpoints and the values of the powerful. And today, perhaps we have the opportunity to do something slightly different. Sociologists should not make any false claims of objectivity. It's pointless, essentially, he was arguing, because it's impossible. We're human. We have feelings. We have values. They're going to creep into our work. Nor should we try to look at a situation from all the possible viewpoints, because actually it's not possible. You are you. You have your own viewpoint. It's OK to do research from that viewpoint and state it and be open to scrutiny as a result of doing so. The sociologists should be aware of their biases, however, and make these clear. So you should state it from the off. This is who I am. This is what I believe. These are my values. This is why I'm doing the research. And provided you do that, it's OK. However, Alvin Gordner argued that Becker is a bit of a peeping Tom who does nothing to help the underdogs that he studies. So in a way, he's saying that Becker is a bit of a voyeur, likes to look at those who are weak or who are the underdogs and notionally give them a voice, but doesn't actually do anything about them. So he just really is almost exploiting them to a certain extent. Functionalism, Gordner argues, projects an image of political and ideological neutrality. And we need to remember that functionalism in many ways was or is the paradigm within which sociology operates, depending on your point of view. Functionalism claims to be above politics and partisanship, that is taking a particular side, when in reality it serves the needs of the status quo in society. And I think it's fair to say that functionalism is generally a small c conservative approach to society because it generally argues that the way things are is good and should for the most part remain as they are. Gordner said that sociology should make moral choices working from values which are radical and focus on the ways in which society can be changed. So he was very much in the kind of Marxist vein of thinking in so much as that he believed that it wasn't just about interpreting the world, it was about changing it. Sociology should enable the least powerful to fight back against those in power. And so in a sense, knowledge becomes a tool by which the powerless can fight back against the powerful. However, taking sides in the way that Gordon kind of advocates sociology should, would be a major step for an academic subject, which generally don't do this. They often at least try to be value neutral. And this could potentially be very problematic because it could well be that if you were to kind of stake a claim and say, this is what we believe, this is what we're going to do as a whole subject area, 
some people may not like that. And so that might cause issues in terms of receiving funding and support and recognition in wider society. Speaking of funding and careers, most research is funded by government. Uh, it is also funded by businesses, sometimes by charities, very occasionally by other private entities. It's unlikely today that most sociologists would fund their own research in the way they did in the past. The reality is who pays for research will control its direction and the questions that it asks. So if we take the government, they're only going to want to fund research which supports their work. They're not going to fund something which fundamentally challenges their work. Funding bodies may prevent publication of the research if its findings prove unacceptable. So if it's not what they wanted, they won't publish it and it's a massive waste of time. Sociologists may want to further their careers and so this may influence their choice of topic. If you've got a choice which is, oh, I really want to research this but if I do it no one's ever going to fund me, I'm never going to get a job versus, well I could research this and I'll get lots of money and become quite famous and have a good job, you're probably going to censor yourself because you're going to fear for harming your career and perhaps harming your life chances and perhaps even uh, harming your family as well in that regard. So for Alvin Gordner, all research is inevitably linked to values, as we have seen. Values influence the topics that sociologists of different perspectives choose, the concepts they develop and the conclusions they reach. So if you're a Marxist, you're very much going to be focusing on things like poverty and capitalism. If you're a feminist, you're looking at things like patriarchy and gender inequality. If you're a functionalist, you're going to be looking at things like how we maintain social cohesion within society and so on. Sociologist values also influence their choice of methods. As we know, Becker wanted to research underdogs, so he tended to use qualitative methods to reveal their world and gain for staying, that sense of empathy, walking in their shoes. If all perspectives involve values, are their findings just a reflection of their values and therefore not objective facts? And if that's true, that would mean, therefore, that it can never be scientific in that regard. That is to say, sociology can never be scientific. What we have here, therefore, is perhaps relativism. Relativism argues that different groups of individuals have different views as to what is true, and these reflect their own values and interests. Therefore, there is no way of judging whether any view is truer than any other. It's just a different set of opinions. And so every group will have its own opinions. No one will be more important than any other. And what you're starting to get here again is hints of postmodernity or postmodernism, aka relativism. Truth is relative to those who believe it, or truth is subjective to those who seek or wish to believe it. Therefore, to tie this together, it is not possible to create any kind of objective fact postmodernist such as Michel Foucault would argue. What are the criteria for distinguishing between what is true and what is not true, Foucault would argue? And how can we know that those are good and absolutely true criteria? In fact, he would argue we cannot know those things. Therefore, no views or perspectives in society are absolutely true. No one person's views are more correct than another's. They're just different. What we're seeing here again is the democratization of truth, where every individual has their own truth. It is truly subjective. And theories are simply meta-narratives. And this is where postmodernists such as Foucault would argue we need to be careful, because who decides what is true? Who decides what the meta-narrative is? Who decides what the paradigm is? And actually, it's going to be the powerful. And so there is a role for those in power to formulate and decide what knowledge is and what knowledge isn't. And that potentially can be very problematic, in particular, when we think about Becker and Gordner and the underdogs and the powerless in society and how they can never formulate knowledge. That's it. Thank you very much.